Welcome to Chats with the Chief. I'm John Jensen, Chief of Staff at the Veterans Health Administration, and this is the podcast where we make small talk about the largest integrated healthcare system in the country. This week, I'm joined for a special episode on the COVID-19 vaccine with Dr. Jane Kim, VHA's Chief Consultant for Preventative Medicine. We'll talk about how VHA crafted their vaccine distribution plan and common concerns for vaccine-eligible veterans and employees. Enjoy the show. Dr. Kim, thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to have you here, and I'm so looking forward to trying to learn some more about vaccine and the vaccine distribution plan. Before we get started, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, hi, John. Thanks so much for having me. So um, my name is Jane Kim, and I'm the VA Chief Consultant for Preventive Medicine. Um, Before the pandemic and before COVID vaccines, my day job was um, creating guidance um, for VHA on cancer screening immunizations. Um, actually treatment for weight management um, throughout the enterprise. So that's what I did before the pandemic hit, but since then I've been involved in the pandemic response and in the past three or four months really focused on getting the COVID vaccine um, into the VA system and getting shots in arms. Great, well, again, thank you for all you've been doing to get that together, it's been great. Uh, One of the things we like to do uh, for each one of these shows is to get to know you, get to know our guests a little bit more. So one of the, some of the questions we ask kind of are just rapid fire questions. So the question is, uh, what book, movie, or TV show are you watching or engaged with right now that you would want to share with us or somebody else? Right, so I've been reading a book um, very slowly, but I have been making my way through it. That's been out for a while, but I've heard a lot about um, called Little Fires Everywhere. Um, it's a novel, and it's, um, I think, taking you through a story which um, really kind of um, looks at um, race and class and the complexities about that. It's written by an Asian-American author, which I also love, and so I'm finally getting around to reading it. I'm reading it very slowly, but I'm making my way through it, and I have heard there is a TV series um, or show on it, too. I'm going to read the book first, um, which I love to do first before seeing any movie or TV series, and then I'm, I plan to watch Um, the Little Fires Everywhere um, series or or show. Uh, What's something interesting or unique about you that uh, that people would want to know or you'd want to share? Yeah, well, one thing is um, I'm currently living in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, but I actually grew up in the Northeast. Um, I grew up in a small town in in central Pennsylvania um, called Carlisle, Pennsylvania, which is near Harrisburg, the capital. So I spend my early childhood there. So, um, you know, whenever I think about our VAs in smaller towns, um, it, it hits home to me because that's uh, kind of a setting where I grew up as well. Very rural. Um, you kind of knew everybody and, and saw everybody at the grocery store. Um, so I just kind of wanted to point that out, that that's where I grew up for most of my kind of early childhood. So is Carlisle where Carlisle Barracks is at, which is an army post? It is. Interesting. That is one of the claims to fame, and Dickinson <laughs> College is the other. Oh, okay. And that's about it. <laughs> I, well, I know of both. I've never been there, but I know of Dickinson College as well as Carlisle Barracks, which is, I think, where they send in the Army majors to become lieutenant colonels, something like that. So it's a great education space that I know that many people have talked about before. Uh, what lesson or piece of advice have you receive that you kind of either fall back on or like to share with others? It's kind of your go-to advice piece. Yeah, one thing that um, maybe no one told me, but I I kind of picked up over time is, you know, when you're a leader, you need to take care of your people. And so I think I, I don't think anyone told me that, but I noticed when leaders did that, um, it really helped to move along the mission but also help people feel supported and to do above and beyond. So that's something I've, I've seen and admired in people that I've worked for and that I try to do now. So I, I think that's the biggest thing that I think of every day is how can I take care of my people and make sure they are supported. Well, I'd, I'd say that you're working on taking care of 362,000 people, so I think you're doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you. So how did you first get into medicine? Was that like a lifelong dream or is it something that kind of changed or happened? Yeah, you know, it was not a lifelong dream. I um, gravitate towards the arts and literature kind of based on what I like to do. And so medicine was never in the picture growing up. I I love fine arts. I love 
um, you know, reading. Um, I was an English major in college, but I think what changed my mind was um, the fact that I'm also very practical and the arts and literature are not quite as practical for a career as I would have wanted. And I also took a class in college that was on public health um, and focused on international public health. And I loved it. Just the fact that you were able to do simple interventions, but it could save uh, thousands and even millions of lives um, was incredible. So I just love that impact and thought, OK, this is what I want to do. So um, becoming a physician, it, it kind of marries the clinical, seeing people face to face with the population approach. Right. So I went into medicine with always with the intent to also do public health, which is what I'm doing now. Yes, and, and again, doing it well. Uh, did you ever expect that you'd be running the vaccine distribution plan for the largest health care system in America? Of course I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> it is a huge task. Um, I will say um, last year when I heard the COVID vaccines were in development, I thought, oh, that's cool. That's exactly what I need or what we need. But I had no idea I'd be leading the effort for the VA. So that was a complete shock. But um, stepping back from it, it's um, what I was trained to do and I'm happy to serve. Um, when I thought even before the pandemic about what makes the biggest impact in preventing disease and death, vaccines are up there. And so to be able to lead the charge and VA to um, get these vaccines out to protect um, all of us is, is just amazing and, and just a true honor. Well, uh, so how do you think or how did you get involved in or how did you begin to plan how this vaccine distribution plan would work? Maybe you can describe for us how that whole process came to be. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So I think what happened in the beginning is that we knew that there were going to be COVID vaccines coming out. But then you start to think through how do you get shots in arms? And there is a lot between a vaccine coming out um, in the public sector and getting the shot in the arm. And so part of what my job was and continues to be um, is to think through the systems and what is needed in each part of our system to make this work. And so, uh, you know, in my mind is just walking through the process and identifying what the needs are at each step and getting the right people on board to develop that step up and to coordinate it. So um, just for example, um, we knew from the outset working with CDC that we would need uh, to get them data on every dose of vaccine that we administered in VA. So then the question is, how do we get that data and how do we transmit it? And so a data team was formed to um, work that. And so the same thing goes for the staff education. Um, how will they know what's special about these vaccines? How should they handle them? These are very different vaccines from any vaccines we've seen before. So how do we get them training? Um, we stood up a team to do that. And all the teams needed to talk to one another. And so it was a lot of uh, smaller teams coming under a big umbrella to make sure we got it all ready for um, all of our colleagues who are doing all the hard work right now to actually put the shots in arms. Yeah, and so you had mentioned before about uh, in, in your in it, you're working with CDC in order to create this plan and, and as well as to pass on information to them. So tell us about how those kind of meetings would go or went about who gets what, how much vaccine is distributed and how many how many doses have already been you know, manufactured and how does that all work? Yeah, so what happened last fall is that we met with CDC weekly and probably emailed with them every day to find out what was going on because as we all know, things like rocketed uh, away with vaccine development all the way through to their um, authorization from the FDA. So every day there were updates. So our team, key leaders from our team met with CDC every week um, and, and email back and forth whenever there was something new coming. And they would tell us, for example, um, so, uh, the Pfizer vaccine needs ultra cold storage. So you guys need to buy freezers. And so we worked that. So every time we got new information or changes in information, we um, put that into our plans and develop that out into what the field would need. Um, so that was the coordination we did with CDC. Um, uh, you know, the other thing that I think I'll mention is that um, as we got information from CDC, we tried to translate that into um, how will our staff in the field know this information and give them enough um, lead time to prepare. 
So, um, for example, there was a tabletop exercise based on some of CDC's materials that we sent out in October to help our colleagues know um, how special these vaccines were, um, how they could develop up their vaccine clinics, et cetera, just to give people some time to think it through and make plans. So um, we tried to make that uh, connection between the CDC information and the field um, kind of flow very quickly to make sure people were um, prepared in advance because it all moved really fast. Yeah, it did really move fast. And I think the communications was key to uh, kind of where we're at to today. today. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, the vaccines that we are, are currently administering, Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, but I understand there's a couple other ones out there uh, that's being uh, looked at right now, Johnson & Johnson being one of them. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, what those are and why are, why are we only seeing those two and what we'll see in the future? Yeah, the two vaccines that are out right now are one by Pfizer, BioNTech, and the other by Moderna. Um, they are both mRNA technology vaccines, and I, um, I know it's probably an oversimplification, but they are almost like twins. Um, and I will say that because they're both the same technology, they're both two doses, they're both incredibly effective at preventing severe COVID illness and death, and they are also pretty safe. And so you have two great options that are out and available now. Um, the reason that those are out and others are not is because those two um, clinical trials wrapped last fall. And so those companies were able to present their data to the FDA for review and authorization in December. So, um, you know, the the two vaccines were studied in tens of thousands of people. And so that data had to meet some minimum requirements for FDA to review it. And so those trials um, have been completed. Um, the other vaccines that are um, currently potentially on their way to us are still um, either almost finished or finished their uh, clinical trial. And so data um, is not yet out um, that I know of, but it's coming maybe this week on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is uh, a single dose. So some people will cheer for that um, <laughs> vaccine. That's a lot easier to handle. Um, I mentioned ultra cold, which is dry right. ice territory and conventional cold as requirements for the first two vaccines. The Johnson Johnson vaccine can go in a fridge and we have heard for up to six months. So a lot easier to handle. How that will line up with the FDA's requirements for safety and efficacy, we still have to see. The other product that's on the horizon is AstraZeneca's, which is out in the UK and the European Union. Also, we have to see how the safety and efficacy lines up, but that is um, two dose series, but also refrigerated. So um, a lot more options to store that versus the Pfizer and Moderna. Great, something to look forward to. You mentioned before about data and we currently have the two, two vaccines with us. Um, and there's a lot of concern, I think, uh, with, with people, employees, as well as veterans about the safety of this. Maybe you could describe with what the data we've seen so far, are these vaccines safe? Are we seeing any concerns? Um, I will say that um, from the clinical trials and from our experience so far, these Pfizer Moderna vaccines are safe and effective. Um, effective is from the clinical trials and safety. We have not seen significant safety signals in the trials or even afterwards with the general public getting vaccines. Um, nothing significant enough for us to be worried about more than any other vaccine. I, I just wanted to tell a story here because I know people here, these vaccines are safe and effective, but they're still skeptical. And I get that. Um, you hear new technology, it makes you skeptical. Some people have, um, you know, in their community, a distrust of vaccines because of unfortunate things that have happened mm -hmm. with um, scientific studies in the past. And so I wanted to tell a story that I was talking with one of my colleagues about how these vaccines were safe and effective. And she said, well, I'm not sure. You know, I hear that, but it doesn't convince me. And so what I said, which I think is key to us as staff um, kind of feeling comfortable with this is that I said, I would recommend this to my family. I think it's safe and effective. I'd rather take the vaccine and get a side effect than get COVID. And I would want the same for my family. And I consider you like my family. So I'd recommend wow. it for you. Um, nothing's 100%, but if I were to choose and recommend something to you, I'd recommend these vaccines. They are safe and effective. And it convinced her. That's great. <laughs> so I think as, yeah, as we get people on board um, because they trust us, 
they tell other people and we kind of go from there. So it does take a one on one approach, but I think it's well worth it. We want our friends and our colleagues to be protected. Very much so. Uh, as a non clinician, maybe you can explain to me as well as other employees that are not clinical about how does how does this vaccine work? What is the components of it that make it work? Yeah, so these Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are mRNA technology, which is really a part of the genetic code from the virus, but just a snip of it. And the snip of it um, codes for a, a protein um, from um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus um, that will help your body uh, mount an immune response, um, both to the vaccine, but it kind of primes it so that if you come in contact with COVID, um, your body already has the antibodies ready to fight. So it's a very small amount of genetic code just for that specific part of the virus. Um, it gets delivered in a little fat bubble. So there are little graphics showing like a little bubble um, as part of uh, what's inside the vaccine. So that's the delivery system. Um, the shot goes in arm and then your body sees the little snippet of genetic code and starts to make um, the protein and then the antibody response, which helps to protect you. So, you know, the people feeling side effects after a vaccine are the body's immune response to build up kind of the strong um, antibodies and other things to help your body fight um, COVID if you come in contact. And, and why two doses and why the time span in between the two? Right. I, the, so two dose vaccines, typically you can kind of think of as a prime. So first dose and booster a second dose to give your body kind of an extra push to get the immune response up. So, um, you know, some vaccines um, such as the Johnson & Johnson one, one dose is sufficient. Um, I know that the uh, Pfizer Moderna vaccine manufacturer studied uh, a couple different doses and um, one dose versus two and found that there was the best immune response after a two dose series. And I think the interval between them, which is either three or four weeks, gives your body kind of sufficient time to uh, respond to the first dose and then you get an extra push ahead with the second dose. I'm not an immunologist to tell you why it's three or four weeks, but I, I do understand that we do need the extra push to get us to the 95% efficacy that we have seen in clinical trials, which is phenomenal. It is phenomenal. And, and the other two uh, vaccines that you mentioned, Johnson & Johnson um, uh, being one, are, are they 95% efficacy as well? So um, we have yet to see the full data from the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. I know that the manufacturer and the NIH have published that um, they have seen the data and the efficacy of the Johnson & Johnson looks to be uh, around 66% effective against preventing um, COVID disease. Now, I think in the land of vaccines, that is still fantastic. Um, that's better than some of our flu vaccines that are currently out there but we have a very high bar with the Pfizer Moderna vaccines going first. But um, I was just talking with my family about this and they said, well, is that better or worse? And I said, you know, I think it's a personal choice. And these days with so many people getting COVID, um, you know, uh, would you rather get a shot and have that level of protection um, versus potentially get COVID? I think it is a choice, but um, these vaccines, as far as I can see, the Johnson & Johnson are still very effective and a great option. Great. So uh, where are we seeing right now for employees and veterans for acceptance rate? Uh, is, it, is it better or worse than it was before? And do we anticipate it getting better in the future? Right. So I, I think acceptance rate is really the shots in arms. And so you um, can say, well, um, were people hesitant or not? And were they before or after? But if they got a shot, I think they're not hesitant anymore. So I just looked at the data today and you know, it looks like more than um, 240,000 employees have gotten at least uh, their first dose of vaccine, and that's terrific. Even more have gotten the full series. And so, um, you know, I think in terms of essential employee vaccination rates, we're, we're, we're moving up every day. Um, I, you know, I, I hesitate to kind of put out there what the numbers are because um, I, I think we're moving up from the essential employees, which are healthcare personnel, to other employees getting vaccine as well. Um, but I think the response has been tremendous, um, you know, with a lot of people getting vaccinated even in the first month and then more coming on board to get vaccinated now. I, 
I feel like people are always knocking down the doors to try to get vaccine. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think it's a good thing. Um, the numbers for employees keep on going up. For veterans, um, I'm just looking here, it's 824,000 have gotten an initial dose and uh, you know more have completed the series. So we've passed the 1 million mark of doses administered yeah. for veterans and staff this week. Um, that's a lot of vaccine and I think it seems like people keep on knocking at the door and saying we want it. So I'm I'm hoping that the um, the enthusiasm is is uh, contagious and it, you know with the rates we have that will push those higher as more and more people say I got it I feel fine why don't you go get it too? Yep. And I think you you also are able to feel a little bit more safe even just being out and about and and doing normal activities that we may not have been able to do before. And as people begin to hear or see about people feeling more safe doing that, maybe that will add on to other people wanting to come in and get the vaccine. What do you Absolutely. think? What do you think about, um, you know, I saw yesterday that once we went over a million doses administered that um, uh, the VA had administered more vaccine than 42 states had. Uh, administered, and that's quite a feat. And then, again, mostly attributed to you and the plan early on of how we were going to get this distributed. But uh, what what do you think is going on in the communities, or what can we do to help get more vaccine and get shots in arms, as you mentioned? Right. Well, I think within VA, um, I've heard from leaders and, and people who are doing the shots in arms in the field. We can do more. We have the setup, we have the clinics, we have the mass vaccination plans, we can do more. So I think internally, we're really well organized to um, do our own veterans and staff. I, I think what's um, been on the table because we've done so well with that is that can we take our people um, and take our systems and help others uh, in states and jurisdictions where they have need. And so um, I think it's just a just a testament to how well we're organized internally and how well trained that we're able to provide potentially assistance to places where um, they may need it. Now, I know the country is looking at many other options on the table, including retail pharmacies offering vaccine. That's a very convenient op option for a lot of people, and they have pharmacists there who can um, handle and, and administer the vaccine. But I think um, with our system and our people who are our, our greatest resource, there's also options for us to assist um, because we know how to do it. It's the same vaccines um, and it's uh, the shots in arms. And so if we can assist, I think I've, I've heard a lot of discussions going on to be able to help our country. If a uh, em employer veteran uh, wants to get the vaccine, how can they go about uh, getting the vaccine? For employees, for um, Veterans Health employees mainly, I think most of us have gotten um, an email or some kind of uh, notification, especially those who are on the front line, um, that it's our turn. And, and I think most of us have already either had the opportunity or, or shortly will have the opportunity to get vaccinated. So internally, I think each facility um, sends out um, communication to let you know where you can sign up and where you can get vaccine. Um, for veterans, uh, we are using, um, and, and actually the employee vaccination is part of this, a risk-based approach. So um, really because supply of vaccine is still very limited in this country, and we knew that was going to be the case last fall, we want to prioritize who gets vaccinated or gets offered vaccine by who's at highest risk for severe illness or death from COVID, thinking those people um, really deserve the protection first. So for veterans, um, I know facilities are going out as they get vaccine through email, through press release, through text saying we have vaccine for your group. Um, most of the groups being offered vaccine now are, are oldest veterans who are 75 and older. And so say if you know someone in, in Tampa um, gets a text um, that their Tampa VA has a vaccine, they can go ahead and sign up and come on in. Um, for veterans who are, are not yet up for their risk group but still want to stay on the list, there is a tool on VA.gov called Keep Me Informed. You can type in your information and it sends that information if you receive VA care to your facility. And um, <clears throat> there's a list there that um, the facility can pull from when it's your turn. So that's a nice tool as well for people who are not yet up um, for their turn but would like to stay informed and, and be called potentially when it is their turn. So there, I know that there's three kind of uh, risk groups right now that CDC recommends, A, 1A, B, and C. Maybe you can describe 
what those are and, and kind of where we're at in that process. And I know as a system, maybe there's a little bit of difference between, it, between the two, specifically B and C, but maybe you could describe that. Sure, so um, CDC did come out with recommendations um, to kind of move through the highest risk to um, lesser risk when vaccine supply is limited. So the highest risk who are um, to be offered vaccine first are healthcare personnel, especially frontline, as well as those um, people who live in congregate living settings, such as nursing homes. And so in VA, we followed that and offered vaccine first to our healthcare personnel with those who are on the front lines, um, such as emergency department and ICU first, and also our veterans living in um, community living centers and spinal cord injury units. Um, so that was the first tier, um, very vulnerable, high risk population. We of course need our healthcare personnel to keep our systems going, as was evidenced by the unfortunate surge um, post holiday. Um, so that's 1A, CDC. After that is 1B, um, and in CDC's 1B, as well as VA's, it's the oldest um, veterans, so 75 and older. Um, we've seen throughout the pandemic that the older you are, unfortunately, the worse your outcomes are from COVID. And so um, based on that information, it made sense to have those who are our very oldest, including a lot of our veterans, to be able to receive vaccine first so they have that protection. Um, see, um, VA also chose to elevate some of our other vulnerable populations, such as our transplant patients, our dialysis patients, um, those receiving chemotherapy and, and homeless veterans into 1B, thinking that they um, are also very vulnerable and need that protection. Um, the last phase um, is 1C, and that these phases are just when vaccine supply is limited. Um, but 1C is, is our veterans who are 65 to 74, so getting a little bit younger here, but still a lot of Vietnam era veterans in there, um, as well as those veterans and people who are less than 65, but have a high risk medical condition that puts them at high risk for severe illness or death from COVID, such as chronic lung disease, chronic heart disease or diabetes, and there are other risk factors. So that is a big group in 1C. Mostly in VA, I think we're still in 1A and in 1B. But um, there are some places which have moved to 1C as um, Dr. Stone authorized people to be very flexible with the phases because um, the vaccine expires six hours after you draw it out of the vial. Right. So if you need to get it to more veterans um, because you wanna use it, go ahead. And that makes a lot of sense too. So we are moving through phases pretty quickly, but still mainly in 1B. But I, I think there are 1C as well who are getting vaccinated. And I think probably in February and March will be pretty squirrely in 1C. Great, and that's really always dependent on the amount of vaccine that we have available. And you anticipate that that continues to increase as uh, manufacturing increases um, on both of those, as well as the additional vaccines, hopefully to come on board. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Um, both Pfizer and Moderna are supposed to be ramping up production and we've already seen some increases, um, but I've heard that the um, true kind of big leaps will happen in February, March. So certainly more vaccine for our country and for VA. And with the additional products, if they get authorized by FDA, even more to come. And I know that the um, uh, dose counts are supposed to reach um, pretty significant high numbers by summer. Um, boy, I can't wait till summer to see that happen <laughs> because we will then be able to offer vaccination pretty widely to the general public um, outside of those who are at highest risk. So. Um, Boy, I, I'm just waiting for June and July because that will be a very happy time from my perspective. So, yeah, from your perspective, what's kind of the, I'm going to say, the magic number when you we hit kind of herd immunity, uh, maybe in the system, but in the country? Yeah, that herd immunity number of, of percent of people in the population who would need to be vaccinated, it really varies. And so I hate to kind of pin it down because I think it also depends on it depends on so many things and these are all estimates, but it depends on how well we do at getting our caseload down, which depends on how well we do the masking, distancing and washing our hands. So it's almost like you have these different variables all feeding into a formula and everyone's kind of guessing to see yeah. what it'll take, but really proof is what happens. Um, you know, I've heard anywhere from 50, 60, 70, 80 percent vaccination might be required, but I 
um, I would love to kind of see where we actually land on that. It depends on the vaccine, but also on um, the level of disease we have. So um, we'll see. But I think uh, the goal to get as many people vaccinated as, as possible is just what we need to do. Yep. Aim as high as you can. And where we land, um, hopefully that'll be enough for her herd immunity sooner rather than later. Yeah, of course. Um, we've talked a lot about um, getting shots in arms. So, um, you know, I've heard some people talk to, does that mean that we should be able to see by June, July, no need to wear a mask? Or is that, is that true or not true? You get the, get the vaccine, you still need to maintain your uh, wearing masks and social distancing? Yeah, you know, we still have to do those things. I think um, I wish um, we could take off masks. In fact, I was watching a little bit of a soccer documentary. My kids play soccer yesterday, and it was filmed last February and March in Europe. And I was like, it's so weird to see people <laughs> without masks in public and how the world has changed. Um, but we do need to wear our masks and, and continue to do all those good things because um, the trials that studied the vaccines, they tell us how well the vaccines protect the individual person who got it but it doesn't tell us whether you are at less risk for transmitting COVID to others if you happen to get it. Um, and if you don't even have symptoms, can you still give it to other people if you end up getting um, infected with SARS-CoV-2? So because we don't know much about whether it breaks the chain of transmission, um, everyone is still advised to do all those same things with wearing masks and such. Now, most likely uh, if the vaccine does break the chain of transmission, but without the science to back it up, you hate to, um, you know, let your guard down during a pandemic. Yeah. So we are still doing all those things and buying more masks, you know, every week to replace the old ones. But right. um, I, I'm happy to do it just because, uh, you know, we don't want to go back to where we were even a few weeks ago after the holidays. Right. And it's become commonplace. And I, I can't imagine here in D.C. getting on the metro without a mask on ever again. Uh, maybe that'll change someday, <laughs> but I don't imagine it happening. Um, you had mentioned before about um, the, the need to um, uh, get additional vaccine and, uh, and get shots in arms. Um, but is there a, a way um, that non-veterans uh, or employees can get the vaccine from the VA, or is that not included in any kind of numbers that we're getting or availability that we're getting a vaccine? Well, you know, the one population that's worth mentioning of non-veteran, non-employees is uh, the primary and secondary caregivers in the program of comprehensive assistance for family caregivers. Um, those caregivers are authorized to get vaccine. There is current legislative authority to do that, and Dr. Stone did authorize that. And so that's a great, fantastic thing. Those caregivers are pulling a heavy load. Um, and so when their veteran is eligible to get vaccinated, they can come in and get a vaccine too. And so, um, you know, I know some of those caregivers may be veterans, but my understanding is most of them are civilian um, non-veterans. So um, that is one population that I know is eligible to get vaccine. Another that um, VA is partnering with actually, um, <clears throat> another federal agency is the Department of Homeland Security. And so those employees who are out in their field, um, who are supporting all of us, um, through Customs and Border Control, through FEMA, um, and, and such. They need vaccine, too. They are certainly essential to the security of our country. And so VA is partnering with Homeland Security to get vaccine to many of their personnel out in the field, um, as uh, DHS does not have a, a medical component to administer vaccine. So those are two big groups that I know are, are in play right now. Um, there's a lot of discussion because everyone out there has done such a great job with vaccinating to see if we can extend to um, reach others as well, whether it be coming alongside a state um, to help them say at a mass stadium event or doing other uh, kind of partnerships to work through FEMA. I know all of that is, is in the works and I bet we'll see a lot of that this spring, but the two that I spoke about, the caregivers and Homeland Security are what we're currently working on and kind of extending our, our resources to serve those populations. And does the Department of Homeland Security, they, they get their own allocation of vaccine. It's not an allocation that, that we're using our own to support them, but that's their allocation of vaccine. Is that correct? Exactly. And that's such an important point. I think people, you know, fear that are we using our vaccine to vaccinate people from other federal agencies because there's just so little vaccine to go around and people worry. But yes, Homeland Security has their own vaccine allocation. 
um, we do have a formal partnership with Homeland Security and through that partnership, um, Health and Human Services gave VA the vaccine doses that were for Homeland Security. So those are added to what we have for our staff and veterans. We're not taking out of our pot. Um, we are getting theirs to administer to them. So that's a really good thing. Um, we are just helping them with the storage and administration arms, which they don't have, but they pretty much gave us their vaccine to help them. Okay. Uh, one of the numbers or things that I've been watching um, from th since the summer, really, or the beginning of the summer, uh, was our employees unable to work uh, because of the infection of, of COVID. And uh, I don't know if you'd seen these numbers, but we were above 6,000 here about a month ago, a little bit longer than a month ago. And, uh, and I believe because of uh, the vaccine administration that uh, we've cut that less in more than half, actually, and we're down around you know 1,500 unable to work today where we were above 6,000, maybe not even a month ago. Do you, do you, have you seen those or do you have any way of knowing? I mean, I think it'd be a pretty good example of how the vaccine works if we ever reduce those numbers so significantly in a short period of time. Yeah, I've seen those numbers. They get briefed to um, senior leadership every day. And, and someone just remarked um, earlier this week, this is amazing. <laughs> it just is phenomenal. There was even something I think out of Vision One where they studied people, um, staff who had been vaccinated and those who hadn't to see how, um, you know, those people were doing with getting COVID. Um, and the, the curves kind of went, you know, like this, people right. who got vaccine, you know, uh, weren't getting COVID and those who were, were, were getting COVID. So it was just, it was just an incredible testament to how well the vaccine's working. Even after one dose, we think there is partial protection, but people getting the second dose is even better. So, um, that just warms my heart because yeah. it means everyone who's been working incredibly hard and, you know, really putting themselves at risk um, is, is I think, getting really good protection from this and that fear and that stress of going in every day. I hope people are feeling a little less of that, knowing that they have great protection through the vaccine. Yeah, I, as you mentioned, I think that that proves that it works. And, and that's what we need to get everybody in to get vaccinated. Dr. Kim, we come to the end of our time. Anything you want to close with? Any thoughts that you wanted to share? Right. Well, you know, I, I think I do want to speak to those people who are still on the fence because those of you who've gotten vaccines obviously are, are you know, have, have bought in. But those of you who are not sure, um, I just encourage you to talk to someone who has gotten vaccinated and see what they thought. Um, you know, and, and if you have questions about it, um, you know, whether it's safe or effective, um, you know, talk to the people you, you, you work with um, or someone you trust or your own physician or, or provider um, to get their thoughts. Um, from my perspective, like I said, I um, would wholeheartedly recommend this to my patients, to my colleagues. I want people to be safe and protected. I don't say that about every service, actually. Some things I say, well, I'm not sure. There are pros and cons, um, maybe more pros than cons, um, but it's, it's really your choice. But if I, I don't know if I'd recommend it to you. But for these vaccines, I would wholeheartedly recommend them. Um, COVID is no fun. It could be mild, but it could be life threatening. And so would I rather see my friends and colleagues protected? Absolutely. And these vaccines are a great way to get that protection. Thank you, Dr. Kim. And thank you for taking the time to be with us today and sharing some insights about the vaccine and the vaccination uh, plan. Uh, thank you again and sure appreciate it. And thank you everybody for watching. I hope you enjoyed today's show. A huge thank you to all of you for listening and a special thank you to Dr. Kim for her time. Join us for our next episode where we get a chance to chat with Mr. Chris Sandals, director of the South Texas Veterans Healthcare System. See you next time.